Okay, so setting the scene. Well, I think we all know um, what affects reliability. Elements in design, test, installation, operation, and in maintenance. So even the, even the, the average person in the street has got a good understanding of what a reliable product is. Um, it's our jobs as design engineers, manufacturers, service support people to make sure that we meet the critical demands of the customer um, on limited budgets and with a good un understanding of what the risk in, in, the, in the product is likely to be. We talk a little bit now about the need for design for reliability. If we consider this, we've got a plot of cost versus reliability here. And the more reliable a component is or a piece of equipment is, the usually the more expensive it is to produce. The more reliable a component is, the less chance and the less cost we'll like to have through its life cycle. Um, there's an, there's, a, there's an, an equitable trade-off here. So the more we spend on building in reliability into a product, the less we expect to spend on fixing it in the field. A nice idea about this is if we can just sum up these costs, then we've got a total production cost so that we can actually manage and we can make a prediction about what our product is likely to cost through life. It's extremely difficult to do. However, if we can do this, we could look at the the minima in this function here, and that could be a definition of what optimum reliability might be for a business. However, it's not as straightforward as that. For one thing, these costs are very difficult to estimate. Also, this optimum reliability, it's uh, optimum for who? And what about high criticality applications? These are the uh, scenarios where a product's being used in a situation where the effect or the severity of a failure is so high that we don't really want to contemplate it. So this is, it's a good principle, it's a good idea to, to actually explain the need for high reliability products and the trade-offs which are involved, but it isn't necessarily the whole picture. So what does reliability mean to an engineer or a practitioner? Someone actually has to do the calculations. Well, product, uh, predicting product or process failures, understanding why they occurred, an improvement program associated with it based on data in an objective way, creating optimized test plans, predicting spare parts or maintenance activities, being able to make risk-based decisions on limited data. Testing is expensive after all. All of this wraps up into really it's good engineering practice. So what does reliability mean to a product manager or budget holder, someone who has to pay for the development of the well, they should be looking to lower manufacturing costs in terms of overtime, downtime, rework. Should be looking to lower through life costs, warranty costs, product recalls, and managing customer satisfaction throughout the life of the product. We should be looking to ensure that the product can do what it actually says on the tin. And being able to provide evidence for dependability claims, being able to say to the client that, yep, our product is fit for purpose because it also gives some additional the tools of reliability engineering, give us insight into contractual compliance, and we can manage our supply chain. Again, taking the emotion out of the interaction using scientific method and real data in an objective way to make sensible decisions. And again, all this wraps up into good management practice. A rule of thumb that we've got in the industry is you've seen in this slide here. It's the, the cost to fix an issue, uh, depending on where you find it in the product development cycle. So if you find a problem in the concept phase, uh, it's, it's pretty cheap to actually do something about it. And you've got enough time to do something about it as well. If you let that problem cascade and you only actually unearth it and discover it once your equipment is out in the field in large numbers, and you can see that you've actually, you're running an awfully high risk of, of, of a high product cost in terms of warranty or product recalls, for instance. Now this one slide in itself should be enough justification for establishing a design for reliability program in, in, in a business, but I'm afraid it isn't always the case. What I'd like to share with you now 
is the current best practice thinking on how design for reliability might fit in to a product development cycle. So we've got some phase gates here. We've got a concept phase, a design phase, development phase, manufacturing phase, and support phase. Some industries, there'll be a decommissioning phase at the end here, but the vast majority is covered by this sort of process. And the activities that we go through in each of these stages are mapped out. For those guys who are familiar with Six Sigma type methodologies, um, it's a very similar idea. In the concept phase, we should be looking to define what our reliability objectives are in relation to the equipment. We should be able to identify what the key risks are. We should be able to assess them um, through the design process and understand where the critical design characteristics and what we need to manage properly um, uh, are actually evolving. We need to uh, be able to quantify what we mean by reliability through the development phase and we need to also assure it through manufacturing and sustain it through support phase. Particularly if you're developing equipment that's got extremely long operating lives. If you're creating stuff that has to sit at the bottom of the ocean uh, for 25 years, that has to work like a blowout protector valve, for instance, you need to be able to qualify that product in an objective and sensible way based on data. Now, one view um, of the typical reliability activities associated with each of these phases is shown on this next slide. So within the concept phase, a good definition of what the requirements and goals are, a good understanding of what the environment in which the equipment is going to be operated and how it's going to be operated through a usage profile, that's essential. Um, that basically will drive uh, the vast majority of activities throughout the entire product cycle. We need to be able to take this information, understand from product generation to product generation how we change things in an evolutionary way. We need to be able to unearth the risks, um, categorize them as those which are important to the design of, of manufacturing, and focus all our, our efforts in terms of understanding those issues and either mitigating or designing out the associated failure modes. And underneath here, in this section here, these are the sort of tools that if you, you can apply, tailor to your individual product development cycle. Some of these tools will be more important than others in some industries, but it's a, a real toolkit for being able to map initial requirements from the customer all the way through to delivering a product that can be used in real operating condition with minimum risk. This is the basis of a, a modern design for reliability program. Hi, can I just check to see that everyone's actually um, hearing me okay? I've got a, a couple of queries here from a couple of the attendees saying that uh, they can't be heard. Would uh, could someone just type in to say they're actually coming through loud and clear? That would be really handy. Okay, can we all hear? That's great. Thank you for your feedback. That's fantastic. Now, as I said at the beginning as well, all these slides will be available on our website that you can download or we can actually email you directly. Um, um, this is, this, this is um, a baseline for us to understand, to get this sort of information out into the field basically. So we'd welcome your comments about the topics that we're going to discuss today as well. And you're very welcome to have a copy of this as PDF. So we talked about the sort of process that you might use for developing um, reliability in the de through the design uh, cycle. Where's the data? Well, it, it's everywhere. You can pick this stuff up from field reports, from standards or supplier databases. Hopefully, you've got some sort of fracas system. That's a failure reporting and corrective action system. That's fancy type for just being able to monitor and log events that come in that are pertinent to your functioning of your equipment understand what they are, have a, have a closed loop corrective action system for deciding on which are the most important issues to deal with, and then having a, an objective way of 
fixing the problem, logging it so that it becomes part of your company's knowledge base for, for future development activities. Fracas system is an absolutely key requirement in all testing class reliability organizations. Every, every company I've come across that's, that's best in class um, has got a, a decent fracas system, even if that's just a spreadsheet. Um, it's absolutely critical that you capture this information, even if it's just a question of being able to discriminate so that you can decide this is an issue that we're going to take forward or not. It's an important process for, our, for actually developing a high reliability uh, equipment. We've also got warranty claims, we've got testing, We've got design calculations or simulation, finite element modeling, CFD. We've also got what's happened with similar products. So there is and there's an awful lot of information. It may not be in one place that's easily accessible, but this information is spread throughout most organizations. So what are some of the most effective DFR tools? Um, the first one, again, this has uh, been driven by the auto industry mostly is a concept called quality function deployment. Um, it's a very straightforward method. And again, it can be implemented in an Excel spreadsheet. Well, there are some tools around on the market that make the process a little bit more efficient. But in essence, it basically takes the sometimes woolly definitions of what a customer needs for a piece of case, matches them to what an engineering specification might require, and then we can rank it in terms of importance between how how each of these customer wants actually matches to uh, a technical characteristic. What we've got here, this little hat on the building, it's sometimes called the house of quality. Sometimes it's part of a voice of the customer exercise. There's a lot of terminology involved in this. But the base of it all is it's a matrix being able to define what a customer wants in terms of some technical characteristics. The roof, the hat of this thing here, actually shows you where you've got a correlation where improving one actually has a beneficial effect on another of your characteristics and also when they are anti-correlated where, where improving one thing might actually reduce the, uh, the effectiveness of another uh, entity. Down below here we've got some targets, this is the, some, some performance metrics or specs that we can actually use to measure how far we are into developing our product. So this is quite a useful function, straightforward to use and you can get on one single sheet of paper the understanding between what a customer wants and how you're going to deliver it in your design. But that doesn't stop there, because if you can chain these little um, QFD, QFDs together, then you've got something very powerful indeed, because then you have an audit trail from taking you what a customer is asking for all the way through your design process to something that you can actually measure as a functional requirement for a product in the field. So this will map out your entire design thinking, all of the trade-offs, all the, the, uh, the decisions that you've had to make in order to build the product and get it out in the field. It's an extremely powerful tool. So how do you go about finding the right risks? more straightforward method is a Famica, fairly mode effect and criticality analysis. Again, it's very easy to implement as a system. Um, there's great software around. Reliosoft, one of the world leaders, are actually delivering this sort of tool. But there, there's a mature industry involved in, in tools to allow you to make this sort of risk assessment now. It can be a lot of work, but in essence, it captures the thought process of what good engineering practice should be. We're looking for potential failures, what the modes, how those failures could occur, what the causes are, what the effects are, and some ranking to say which are the most important, which ones should we actually operate on uh, if our budgets and time and resources are limited. It can be a significant amount of work, but it is another piece of work. It's a document that can actually crystallize the design thinking and the constraints and the requirements that you need to meet in order to get a piece of equipment which is fit for purpose. These are typical uh, screen grabs of what a Famica looks like. You can see what, uh, one version looks a lot like an Excel spreadsheet. You can have a hierarchical view, or you can have this large worksheet type view. The key thing is that you capture the right sort of information in an efficient way. And like I said, there's a lot of software around now that can actually help you do that. Reliosoft's one of the better ones. What are the possible outcomes of a Famica? Well, it immediately gives you a critical items list. 
you know, your risk register or identifies critical application areas. It can help in, in your de definition of test plans, it can help in assembly instructions, help in error proofing. Your SQA guys, your supply quality assurance guys can make use of this for being able to be able to understand where the key risks are in your supply chain. It can help you understand maintenance plans. And uh, in process for me, because it can generate process control plans. So it gives you an awful lot of insight and can lead towards an engineering best practice. One of the key deliverables from a good Formica is input into a designed experiment. So DOE is, is a statistical uh, process for trying to get the, the most amount of information out of a limited test budget again. Um, it flows on naturally for Formica. Uh, we arrange a, a number of experiments number of experimental runs varying um, all of the factors simultaneously. and We use a, st a statistical method to unpick the impact of each of these factors so that we can then optimize either some sort of yield uh, or, or reduce a cost or we can compare different designs or understand how changing a particular variable or one of these factors might influence the, the lifetime of the product. This is an expensive business. To actually test and qualify, quantify what the lifetimes of equipment is going to be in, vari in variable usage rate uh, environments is an extremely expensive and extremely difficult thing to do. But there are tools now. Again, reliability engineering is, 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 is matured in the last couple of decades to the point where these tools are easily accessible, the methodologies are well understood, and being able to use them um, in an appropriate way can bring the business real benefit. These tools are all aimed about managing risk. And of course, with DOE, there's uh, there's possibility of actually incorporating not just physical testing, but the use of simulation as well for some of the uh, some of the experiments. There's a little example here to show a uh, simple design of a motor. If I'm testing a, a particular design of a motor, I have some factors here that I want to change. We've got five factors, wire type, wire diameter, wire tension, winding method, coating material. Five factors, we've got two levels, um, two different types here, two levels here, two levels here. So we, what we've actually got is five, five factors, two levels. That's 32 potential permutations of our experiments. Using a DOE methodology, we're able to reduce the number of experimental runs, but maintain a high level of predictive capability, understanding of what the outcome of those experiments actually means. This is the ReliSoft tool, and we're able to actually measure lifetimes in this, where we've got failures, or, or the results of an experiment where um, the, the motor actually survived the test conditions. Uh, this is what we, is used in life data analysis, or libel analysis. So we can incorporate this into a DOE program now, and make predictions about lifetimes using limited experiments budgets. One output of this is uh, we can generate a, uh, an equation which shows us how the factors actually change. So if we want to maximize motor life in this particular instance, then we have a, this equation can actually point us towards qualifying. If we set some of these factors to the highest level, some to low, it also tells us which of these factors are actually insignificant in the design in relation to measuring the lifetime of the product. Lifetime of the product has an immediate impact onto warranty considerations and service costs and all of that sort of stuff. So being able to reduce the amount of testing, have a high confidence in being able to get insight into what the testing is actually telling you using a DOE process uh, and, and allows us to make some business decisions um, about the, the eventual reliability of the equipment in the field. We're not just limited to using physical testing though, and there's a real push in the industry to actually develop simulation uh, approaches as well. We have a CFD, finite element modeling. Um, what we can do with that, of course, is we can make parametric models, we can do what-if scenarios. Uh, the technology is, is, is advancing all the time, but it's reached a level of maturity now where we can actually gain insight and, again, reduce the cost in, in, in test and qualification. 
This leads neatly onto the concept of accelerated testing. We can develop our DOEs or we can develop our test plans. Instead of testing at normal operating conditions though, we can use accelerated profiles. So we may take a piece of equipment, may be susceptible to temperature or humidity or vibration, and we may want to put that in a test regime with, an ex with a higher stress to try and excite the failure modes which will be, will, will be evident through life but we want to understand this in a shorter period of time. If we're developing a product that maybe has an operational life of five years, the development program of 12 months, we may only have a couple of months worth of testing within that to establish whether we have any epidemic type failure modes which may affect a, a large population once it's out in the field. So using an accelerated test program is a very good methodology We've been able to expose these failing modes and understand how they may affect the, the reliability through life. The approach we use is, is life data analysis, specifically Weibull analysis, so we can get um, a plot here of lifetime versus, uh, versus chance of failing, basically, on reliability. And if we can do this at several stress levels and we can create a relationship between the stress and life, then we can then predict back to user levels, user usage rate levels, the typical user levels, what the likely impact, how, how our, our failure modes are going to be operating, and what sort of effect they're going to have through a normal operating period. It's an essential feature of any DFR program now, because this is a way of exposing the failure modes and understanding their behavior through life. Why is Weibull analysis so important? Well, it's a generic analysis tool. works with very limited data sets and gives you insight. Um, the Weibull parameters have physical meaning. These parameters are beta and eta. It tells you something about the shape of what the failure rate function, how failures will evolve through time or exposure in the operating environments. So with very little effort and, and using test data, we can actually make predictions over how likely a particular component is going to fail in a particular environment through an operating cycle. It models all types of um, failure mechanisms, infant mortality, wear out, corrosion, electrical migration, and it's the most widely used technique, and there's a huge amount of literature. It's been in the, around now for about 60 years, but again, software's caught up, and now the tools to allow you to do this sort of analysis of sit on a PC, on, a, on every, they could sit on every engineer's desktop. Those guys are familiar with the, the bathtub curve. It's a, it's a unifying concept in reliability where we talk about populations uh, of equipment. We have this behavior here where we'll, this, is, this region here is called wearing or infant mortality. It basically tells us how, how the failure rate of the equipment uh, decreases with time once it's bedding in. In the electronics industry, uh, this is the whole rationale behind using a burn-in program in order to weed out the, the, the components which are susceptible to this type of failure mode in this region. Over this region here, we have wear out. This is where we have uh, your chance of failing with the increases with exposure, like erosion, and corrosion, that sort of idea. Now, there are several functions we can use to actually to model these regions. Log normal, normal for wear out, exponential in this region here. This is where the MTBF region is. But Weibull sits across all three paths. So we can use the same distribution to actually understand where we are on this, on this path to the curve. And it's one parameter within the Weibull function that tells us that. This value beta. Depending on that number, it tells us whether we're in a decreasing failure rate condition, whether our failure rate is independent of time or exposure, and whether our failure rate is increasing with uh, exposure to the operating environment. Very powerful tool. We can use Weibull analysis, life data analysis, to actually generate these sort of distributions as well, where we've got uh, some, some measure of what the operating conditions are, some measure of the stresses which the, the equipment's going to be exposed to. We can also use the same technique to de determine the strength distribution of the population. How well the equipment that we've got is, can actually tolerate the, the operating conditions that we're putting it into. If we know these two distributions, and they're quite difficult to get, they're an expensive thing to get, 
But using tools like Weibull analysis, we can get some good insight into what these distributions actually look like. Then the overlap of these two distributions here, this represents the, the, the proportion of the, of the population which are, which are going to be affected by this, by, by, by this region of the stress distribution. So all of, these, all of these elements of the population here will fail because the stresses they, ex, they are experiencing exceed their strength. One of the, the goals of design for reliability is, is to actually manage this interaction of stress versus strength. So we can improve um, the likelihood that our equipment will survive in its operating condition if we increase the design margins, if we move the total strength of the population further to the right here, we, have, we can have little effect on this, operating, on this operating stresses in most cases. So one way forward, one strategy forward is to actually increase the strength. This reduces the overlap between our stress and strength distribution so less of the population will fail. What we can also do is reduce the variation in product strength. This, those guys are familiar with Deming's ideas about quality. Um, again, this is the whole basis of, of Six Sigma in manufacturing, is to reduce variation. So if we make this more peaked, and we can, again, we can bring in this tail here, so it's not overlapping as much with the, with the, the, the operating stresses. So again, we reduce the, the percentage of the population that, can, that are failing through life. Or we can limit in some way the effects of uh, the environment. Um, that's much more difficult to do. But these are three typical ways in which uh, typical DFR strategies. We talked a, a little bit about components and equipment, but uh, how might we model more complex equipment and systems? Well, we can use a, a methodology called reliability block diagrams. This is where we represent the system by individual blocks, and these can be blocks. Uh, these blocks are either functions, they're pieces of equipment, um, and each of these blocks has, has properties. They have repair and failure properties. And if we can link these blocks together, this is then a model of what our system looks like in, in terms of reliability. The lines which connect the blocks actually create the architecture. It shows us whether we have a series type system where if I have blocks in, in a series system, any one of these blocks that represents a piece of a component or piece of equipment, if any of those blocks fails in a series system, the whole system fails. We can have parallel um, architectures. We can have K out of N structures. RBDs are an extremely important uh, methodology these days. If you're looking to understand what the life cycle cost of your equipment is going to be in complex usage patterns or throughout a uh, throughout the life. If you, you can actually start to predict spares requirements, you can start to look at where there may be potential weaknesses in the design, where dominant failure modes are, where, where pieces of equipment actually that have the biggest influence on the reliability of the entire system. So RBDs can be done in a concept stage, you know, they can be considered as a black box to scope out what the specification of that particular piece of equipment might might require in order to meet a higher level system goal. It's a simple example here. There's four architectures to do with uh, it's a computer network, and an RBD can be used to predict uh, reliability, a survival probability against each of these architectures. So we can understand the impact of the way in which we put this equipment together. We can also specify whether we're using off commercial off-the-shelf type equipment or whether we have bespoke special high reliability equipment that we can put in our designs, we can use this as a simulation tool to try and get to a cost-benefit decision about how much effort, how, how, how much we have to put into our equipment and design in order to meet a reliability goal through life. So, we can establish specification boundaries. We can establish subsystem and component requirements. We can use it in design optimization in terms of whether we use a redundant system, um, what sort of equipment we can use in, 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 what, in what architecture. We can use it for scenario modeling. We can have running costs, potential failure modes, and when they will occur through life. We can use it to actually uh, appraise different designs, look at design selection, or actually help manage in the supply chain. 
as well as um, the typical use, in, in certainly in the process industries, utility industries, of calculating how many spares we might need through life. The DFI is a concept that's been around for an awfully long time. Um, it hasn't been taken up by a lot of industries, uh, even though most of the techniques are very straightforward. Um, there's a lot of engineering best practice already done, but stringing it together into a program which can bring benefit to the, the business in general and manage risk through the entire product development cycle is, is proving difficult in, in a lot of industries. I'd like to share with you some information. Again, if this is freely available, um, you can actually get the, the, the summary document at the Reliasoft website. But this is a, a, a result of a survey that was done a little bit in recent times. Um, it's a self-selecting group who came back, and the list of participants, um, they, they include most of the best-in-class reliability leaders in the industry today. So what these guys are saying is probably as good as it gets in the industry today. It's, it's an interesting view. So as far as the data is concerned, the split by region is it's mostly in North America. It's mostly in energy, technology, engineering services. Is, there's now the respondents. But we do have quite a good mix of people in there as well. And the interesting point about this is, that, again, these are these are the best guys in the industry who are responding. Um, only 40% of them do this sort of reliability program planning that can evolve into a design for reliability um, capability. In, only 40% of them do in design. 30% in concept. There's a significant number in, in, that actually do this through the qualification program. That's at the end of the development activities in most instances. 7% are doing it in manufacturing. Now, most of the fairly modes will have been crystallized into the design by the time that these guys are actually getting anywhere near establishing a reliability program. And these guys are the best, um, or they're, they're at least they're the, the best in class of this. So it's a sobering thought to think where, 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 where your organization may sit in front of this. The sort of tools that are commonly used in, in the, the organizations that responded to as well, again, 80% use Formica. That's still 20% that don't. So how they assess risk on complex equipment or through their manufacturing process, it sounds like that might be a bit ad hoc. Reliability life data analysis, Weibull analysis, that's a very high proportion. 60% uh, of the respondents here are using it. But if you don't use a tool like that, uh, which can use sparse data, small amounts of test data, and link it with field reports, if you don't use those sort of tools, um, how else can you get insight into how failure modes can evolve um, through the product life? I'd say it's very difficult. Again, with FRACAS, there's just over half the organizations have an established FRACAS system, a failure reporting and corrective action system. So it's a very interesting and, and, and sobering snapshot of what the best-in-class guys are doing currently. There's a lot of room for improvement on doing this, uh, but there is a real business benefit for using these tools in, in, in a sensible way. The common complaints that are coming from this sort of survey as well, it's the sort of stuff that I think we, you know, we, 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 hear, we hear around the patch. Uh, lack of test time and resources to execute a reliability program. Um, lack of management support, lack of understanding of reliability engineering methods. Um, not using field failures as part of the development um, cycle to actually learn lessons and embed them into the processes for, for new generations of products. There's nothing new with these issues. And, and, and again, you know, everyone suffers these sort of problems. But there are methods around, there are tools around, not just software tools, but the methodologies around that can actually reduce the risk in developing products or managing, managing them through life. It's the sort of tools as well that every engineer ought to know. So although for this particular survey, um, the, most of the respondents actually managed to, to develop a reliability um, program within the design stage, uh, a good proportion didn't. Quite a lot were doing Formicas, but again, a good proportion weren't. And if you don't have a Formica or, or some form of risk assessment, which can 
differentiate between the critical design issues, or the issues that are going to be critical to your customers, um, it then becomes it, you, it becomes difficult to decide on what you must fix next. What is the ranking? And unfortunately, urgent problems can get resolved by the person who can speak the loudest, as opposed to what the important type of issues are, which are actually going to affect the product through life. So there's real opportunity to develop. Um, link these tools and tailor them to your own requirements. So in essence, design for reliability is all about managing risk. From concept all the way through into, into when the, the products are actually out in the field in customers' hands. The whole, all, the whole goal of this is to manage the risk of, of, of the development and, and use of the products. That's all. We can do this in a structured way, again, in a Six Sigma type methodology where we define, identify, assess, quantify, assure, and sustain. We can use each of these individual tools, but knit them together into a sensible strategy so that we don't always need to develop products which have super high reliability. Uh, again, we've got to link it with what the requirement of the customer is. If your customer will accept a certain level of unreliability, then that's something that has, an, has a very, very high impact into the cost of actual manufacturing. You won't know that unless you ask. So what are some of the strategic issues associated with implementing a design for a reliability program? Well, you've, you need to top management commitment. You need to be able to implement effective methods and procedures. You need to bring your supply chain along with you as well. Tools to actually select and help manage uh, your suppliers and bring them along and develop them. Uh, there needs to be effective training. You need to do effective research and development, tailored, focused, again, with the use of DOE, design of experiments, and with a good fracas system so that you understand your historic problems and are able to quantify and, and actually hit the 20% the of those items which cause you 80% of the grief. Without a fracas type system, that's extremely difficult. So bringing all these things in together and being able to start early enough to actually make an impact on the product, those are the key strategic issues associated with DFR. What are some key tactical issues? Um, it's important to get a good reliability specification, and most products really don't. If if you've got a mean time between failure for a piece of kit, you're probably that you're probably lucky to get that in, in most industries. But again, that's a concept that's not very well understood. And understanding the variation and what the confidence might be in, in actually using a single parameter number like MTBF is again not very well understood. There are design analysis tools which are available: QFD for Mika, Fault Tree, Reliability Block Diagrams simulation, FES, CFD, all these tools are around and been known about for a very long time. The trick is to tailor it in a sensible way, an objective scientific method for your industry. You can pick and mix which of these tools are required depending on what your customer needs from, the, from that particular product. Having effective testing, design experiments, highly accelerated life testing, again, can bring benefit. But most of the DFR tools here need to be viewed in, as a form of insurance. They're all going to be a cost up front. This is one of the key issues. But being able to understand that paying, paying some money now to do some tests to qualify the failure mode and understand exactly how that's going to affect a large population of your equipment once it's out of your hands in the field. Long term, that's over the life cycle of the product, that, that, can, that can save you an enormous amount of money. These tools are all aimed specifically at managing risk in terms of cost and to reputation of, of, of the business. And if used in that way, they can be extremely effective, but they usually do involve an upfront cost. Having a FACAS system is important to pull together issues that are in design, test, production quality, in field, etc. And, and be, taking the, the view of a whole life plan so developing your products, not from the point of view that you develop it up to the point where it just leaves the factory, but viewing it as a business cost as to how this, how this product is going to perform in the field. 
and of course having suitably qualified and experienced people within the program. So summarizing all this together, quantifying risk in terms of probability is great for a practitioner, but it doesn't help a senior decision maker uh, uh, in every occasion. Putting putting risk in terms of cost to the business, uh, warranty costs, uh, downtime costs, all that is far more valuable in my in my opinion. Now you need to do the probability calculation. You need to understand the risk, how likely an event is going to be. You also need to assess the severity of a, of a likely failure mode as well. What's the effect going to be? The combination of those two should be should drive um, this quantification of risk. But putting that risk in terms of, of, of money is really the only really effective way of actually influencing and improving reliability through product development. That's what. That's what I've seen through my career. Use the computer-aided engineering tools as soon as, as early as possible. Um, that's FE, CFD, RBD simulation. Um, and use data that you've got in the field, in your business as well. If you've got the FRACAS system, that's a goldmine of information. Being able to define the operating environment, the mission profile, expected level of reliability, what your clients are expecting, your customers are expecting. And involving your suppliers uh, is, is critical to actually developing products which uh, are cost-effective through life. Understanding and dispositioning your failures. Again, um, absolutely critical to understand if there's, in terms of a, an evolutionary design process, reducing operational stresses and reducing production variation. Again, from a Six Sigma point of view, lots of organizations are already doing that now. But there's a real reliability payoff for doing just that. And fostering a culture um, in-house and, and with your supply chain is absolutely vital. It's not just in the high-risk industries. It's not just in the oil and gas or the aerospace or, or nuclear industries now. Um, customers are getting more sophisticated. The requirements are becoming more, more constrained, more product functionality, faster. All of this leads to requirement for understanding the product just a little bit better. Um, if you found any of this information interesting, uh, we are running, a, uh, through Wilds, we're running a, 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 how, how simulation can improve whole life product um, development. Uh, we're running that in Cambridge and, and at Daresbury. Uh, there's also, there's uh, what's called the ARS, that's the Applied Reliability Symposium. That's administered by Reliasoft, but it's an industry forum for best practice, for networking, for understanding what other people are doing with these reliability methods. Uh, it's in, in Warsaw in Europe this year. It's on the end of March. But they, it's around the globe. There's four or five of these events throughout the year. Uh, there's details on Reliasoft.com. They're, they're events well worth going to. Um, OK, so um, if I can just step through the questions. Okay. Does anyone have a question? I think I'm getting some response here saying um, this all seems fine. It's pretty straightforward. Um, the audio is dropping out a little bit. I apologize about that. But um, this 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 presentation will be available as a PDF, and we we'll, we we can email to all of those who actually signed in today, um, it will be available for, for an extended period on the website. So please come and visit us at wildanalysis.co.uk um, and you can, you'll be able to download a copy there. But I think what we'll probably do is we'll email all the attendees today the PDF. That makes life a little bit more, more easy for you guys. Okay, I've got a question here that says, um, what decision criteria do you use in Weibull analysis when considering maximum likelihood estimation versus least, square, least squares rank regression? Um, well, there's some general rules of thumb in the industry. If you've got a complete data set, if you've got 10 things on test, 
and you're going to fail all 10 to destruction, then a rank regression on such a small number of samples uh, will probably give you a least biased approach, uh, a least bi biased prediction. Um, I would use MLE if you've got fairly large numbers of failures. If you've got 20 or 30 data points that you're looking at, and specifically if you've got a complex arrangement of of suspensions, if you've got bits of kit in there that have, have got very large lifetimes of survival beyond the actual, uh, uh, if the split between failures and survivors is, is quite large, and if you've got a large number of, 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 of events after, after the final failure, then MLE is the only real mechanism for incorporating the survival lifetimes with the failure lifetimes. Uh, rank regression is, is, has an issue with the in that survivors, if at the point of analysis, don't get incorporated in the in the estimate. So if you've got if you've got if your data is set something like you've got ten failures, you've got twenty devices which have lived beyond the test time, um, then MLE will discriminate between that data. Um, our rank regression won't discriminate between just the failures and the suspensions. I hope that hope that makes sense. Rule of thumb is small numbers of samples, uh, complete data sets, so 10 things on test, 10, 10 destroyed. I would use rank regression. If you've got 30 data points, MLE is much better. It's least biased, uh, particularly if you've got a large number of survivors of a test. Uh, MLE will discriminate that information and rank regression won't. Okay, do you have any other questions? Uh, I've got lots of th lo lots of, uh, of of comments coming in saying uh, thanks, very interesting. Um, also, a few saying uh, the, the the sound quality wasn't too good. Um, we'll take that on as a learning point. We'll try and do something about that for the next session. Okay, I got getting some get some comments in saying the sound was fine. Uh, there's a question here regarding uh, DOE. Just about how do you incorporate the R square R square predicted and R square adjusted value in DOE exercises and the resulting uh, regression equation? Um, there's a couple of ways of doing that. Um, there is a, a a way of actually getting a, a an equation which shows you the variance of your prediction. Um, I would use that. Um, we uh, what I can do if you email me directly with that question what I can do is I can send you a little case study back that shows you how we do that that might be easiest to do um, so who, who, whoever sent me that please please uh, send me an email saying um, hi um, interest in DOE can you explain a little bit I think it's um, is it Abraham so if you could um, you send me that, Abraham. We can have a discussion offline on that because it, it it's probably easy to do with a, with a, with a couple of charts to show you. Okay, um, we can be contacted here uh, anytime at wildanalysis.co.uk. My name is Mike McCarthy. Um, I'll be delighted to uh, discuss your reliability requirements. Um, a copy of the PDF will be available. It's got our contact details on there, and if any of this stuff is uh, is of interest to you we'd be delighted to talk to you so please um, uh, get in contact because we we like to know a little bit more about what the industry is doing okay well if if there's no further questions um, thank you for your time today and uh, I look forward to speaking with you uh, regarding reliability uh, in the future. Thanks a lot. Bye.